So good morning, everybody. Everybody have a good week? Pretty good week? Sort of good week? It's 8 o'clock in the morning, right? <laughs> so um, a couple of things I want to talk about before we get into today's lecture materials. Um, number one, remember that your first activity assignment is due October 1st, so that's coming up. So that's when your first activity would be due um, to me. You remember, you have to do three activities uh, in that activities assignment during the course of the semester, but we want to make sure that you're not trying to do them all at the end, so we're trying to space them out. So you need to make sure you have that first activity done by October 1st. So if you have an activity that you're not sure will count, please send me an email with some details. I can't remember who, but somebody's already sent me something, and I approved that activity. So just send me some, some information about it if you think that th it may or may not count. Um, and so that'll be due on October the 1st, that first one. Any questions about that before we move on? No? Okay. So you had three things to either watch or listen to uh, for today. What was your favorite? You like the podcast? Okay. Why'd you like the podcast? Yep. That's right. Don't you think he wishes right now he had retained at least some of those patent rights, right? Multi-billion dollar industry. Hasn't won a Nobel Prize yet. Started off as a meteorologist and ended up making some of the most impactful scientific uh, discoveries, uh, at least for you all, right? I mean, everybody probably right now has at least one device with them that's using his technology. Yeah, he's very happy, right? I mean, 97 years old and still goes to work every day, right? That's something, right? That means you must enjoy what you do. That's the difference, in my opinion, and this is purely my opinion, that is the difference between a job and a career. Now, some people will tell you I've got a career because it's a, it's, a, it's a term that we use, but a lot of people, their career, quote, unquote, in air quotes, is really a job. They get up, they don't particularly care to look forward to it, they go, they do their time, they do it well most of the time, and they go home and forget about it. But if you truly have a career, really it is something that you have some, in my opinion, it, ha it is something that you have a certain level of passion about. And it's okay to have a job. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, I grew up in a blue collar family myself where my dad went to a job every day. I mean, he did it well, but you know, what he really wanted to do in life wasn't that job, you know. Uh, I'm fortunate enough that I have a career. I get up every morning and I look forward to coming to work. I look forward to the challenges that, that, that uh, are before me. I look forward to interacting with students. I look forward to interacting with faculty in, in a variety of, of aspects. And so I think everybody in this room needs to think about that. You know, whether you go on into medicine, and medicine is a career, but you know, there's a lot of doctors that get up every day and go to a job. And um, again, nothing wrong with that, but I think having a career is more fulfilling than just the money that you make. I make a, uh, a darn good living, uh, but that's not, the th that's not the thing that motivates me. Uh, I do enjoy what I do uh, every day, uh, whether I'm doing the administrative side of it or the teaching side of it or the service side of it. Um, and so I think uh, it, you, you will be fortunate if you have a career as opposed to a job. And I'm wa I want you all to think about, think about that a little bit, okay? What else about the podcast? What were some other take home messages from the podcast? Yep. He did, that's right. So, you know, and that's uh, even though, you know, he's a ninety seven year old chemist that's 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 been to World War II and the whole nine yards, right? A lot of what you're hearing from his story, I think, resonates today for many students on campus, maybe for many of you, right? Uh, I certainly was a student, a first-generation college student, 
my mom and dad, uh, while they were encouraging of me to go to college, were, were very much so like, uh, good luck. You know, uh, come home if you want a meal, <laughs> kind of thing, uh, for the most part. Uh, I, got, I did have a lot of emotional support, but I didn't have a college fund. I didn't have um, a set of parents at home like my daughter does that, that went through education, got higher education, right? And so uh, when I ran into uh, and stumbled in things in college, I had to figure it out. And I certainly didn't have a class like this one where I was being prepared for the major. It was sit down, these are the classes you need, good luck, only about a third of you will make it through to the end and we'll see you later. We no longer have that attitude in higher education. We don't want just a third of you to make it through. We want all of you who want to be in this uh, field for whatever reason, we want you to make it. And so we are here uh, rooting for you, pulling for you, helping you any way that we can uh, these days. And so it, it was a different time, a different attitude, uh, and I think we're better off for having the attitude that we have now of, of one of student success. Okay. That does not mean we lower our standards at all. It means we help you achieve your standards. In the past, they just set a standard and said, good luck. Uh, you either sink or swim. And that is definitely not the, the situation we're in. And that's why I'm bringing in certain resources to talk to you about things so that you know what's available on campus and what your, your opportunities are to help you achieve your potential. But yeah, I mean, you know, he went to, where'd he go? Where'd he go to college? Yale. He went to Yale, right? And he's... Huh? I was shocked when I heard that. Yeah, kind of surprising, right? I mean, he, he goes to Yale. Uh, he's trying to find a way to get his room paid for. He's trying to get a way to get his tuition paid for. He's working in the summers. I think it was the summers, right? Uh, tutoring people to, to make the rest of the money that he needed. You know, and then he's, he's not even in chemistry, is he? What's, what's his major? Yeah, he was a mathematics major, right? So he was doing math, World War II breaks out, things get put on hiatus, and somebody says, you know, you probably ought to be a meteorologist. So he goes on and is a meteorologist, and then comes back, uh, does more physics than chemistry, really, right? And uh, ends up, uh, ultimately, at the advice of his wife, ends up going to Oxford for a while and is now in, in Texas at the age of 97. And certainly he is, he is uh, recognized as somebody who is Nobel competitive. But I want you to know, you know, he did not have a point A to point Z trajectory, did he? Or a point A to point B. It wasn't a straight line for him. He took and meandered and finally found uh, success uh, along the way. And so you all will, uh, many of you will have the same, si same uh, type of, of path. You all know what you want right now, but it may not be an A to B path to get there. Some of you will run into obstacles. You will run into money woes. You will run into life happens. But if you keep focus, right? I mean, he never gave up on himself. That's the thing, right? He always knew he could do better, and he always uh, kept that up. So, yeah, I, I love listening to the podcast. Um, and so every week I'm going to try to, it may not be a podcast, but I'm going to try to give you a, uh, either a reading or a podcast or something from Chemical and Engineering News, which is the trade magazine for the American Chemical Society. Uh, and it is chock full of good information that isn't just, you know, it, it's not opening up a chemistry journal and reading the science. It's about the industry. It's about uh, the fields. It's about academia. It's about people and what. Uh, they've been achieving. So I, I think it's a great resource, and we will uh, definitely be, be using that throughout the semester. So hopefully you all can take some, some things from the society. I would also encourage you all, if you are thinking about being a professional chemist or biochemist, I would highly encourage you to join. It's not that expensive for a student to join the American Chemical Society, and you would get uh, subscription access to chemical and engineering news and discounts on a variety of things. And so it was, it's something that I would encourage you to do. I've been a member since I was in your seat. Um, so this would have been 1992 for me. So I've been a member of the American Chemical Society since 1992, which I think is earlier than most of you were born, right? So uh, I've, been, I've been a member of the ACS for an awful long time. There were two other 
uh, videos that I had you watch. What was so important about those? The history of the periodic table. 2019 is the international year of the periodic table. And I think it would be a shame if you all were here as chemistry majors this year and didn't have some exposure to that big celebration that's going on across the globe. And you will all have a writing assignment for your journals that I will send out to you later about finding information on the International Year of the Periodic Table, about things that are being celebrated across the globe. So what was so, I mean, you all have had science in high school, you're in general chemistry. So what's so important about a table with elements listed on it? Yeah, everything that we know of in the universe is sitting on the is made up of the stuff that's sitting up on the periodic table, right? And so it's a great way to catalog everything. You cannot have biology, you cannot have physics, you cannot have anything without that periodic table and the elements, well, the elements that comprise the periodic table, right? We are built of this material. The universe is built of this material. Understanding this material is very, very important an understanding of life and how it evolved and how it became to be and all that kind of good stuff. Okay? What else about those two videos? That's right. So who's credited with the periodic table? Mendel is, right? But is he the only person that took a stab at it? No. There were many other stabs at that particular periodic table. It's different for you all today. You all have phones. I too have a phone. <laughs> uh, you can get periodic table apps. You should have one on your phone as a chemist. You should have immediate access to the periodic table. Uh, when I was in your boat, we used to make small copies of the periodic table and laminate them and carry them in our wallets and our bags and everything. I kid you not, because the periodic table is going to help you in so many ways that you don't know um, yet. There are times when I go to the lab where I'm talking to my graduate student and I'm like, well, let's pull out the periodic table. Let's see what we might predict the chemistry to be if we change, for example, an oxygen atom or a sulfur atom to a selenium atom. We had this conversation just the other day. So we were literally going to change one atom for another in a molecule that we were making and we needed to predict what how might that work in biology? And so we were looking at the periodic table. You know, and we were, we were asking ourselves about molecular weight differences, and we were asking ourselves about valence electrons, and we were asking ourselves about uh, reactivity trends, those types of things, and the periodic table helped us to do that. Okay? The periodic video that you saw from periodic videos, the one with the guy with the bushy white hair, right? Martin Palyakov. That is a famous set of videos, and there's, pro there, there's at least one video for every element. Uh, if you get bored at night and you want a little entertainment, I would highly recommend you go on YouTube and watch periodic videos. There's an awful lot of information there about science, and the professor who got knighted as a result of this video series that he put together, at least in part, is very entertaining. They talk an awful lot about the different elements. You will probably learn more about the elements itself by watching those videos than you will ever get just in a single general chemistry class. Okay, because they, they can, you can watch them in order, you can watch them however you want to watch them, but they are good videos. There's always demonstrations, explosions, fires, melting things, things doing weird kind of stuff. It's kind of, it's kind of entertaining, so I'd highly recommend that you all uh, do some of that. Okay. So what, what power does the periodic table give us? That's right. It, yeah, so when they were originally putting together the periodic table, right, they recognized that there were holes, and they hypothesized, right, they did the scientific method, they hypothesized that there should be an element there, and they had to go looking for it, right, and they ultimately found those elements, right? We're now at a point where we believe we have everything that's naturally occurring and now we're dealing with new elements that we make synthetically in nuclear reactors and in uh, particle accelerators and those kinds of things. 
Okay? And even though you might think, hmm, that doesn't sound very useful, some of that chemistry actually turns out to be quite useful in like the um, uh, treatment of cancer, for example. There's one uh, periodic video where they talk about the thorium cow, and it, it's not really a cow, it's a bottle full of this material, but they recovered this from nuclear waste, and it undergoes decays to give thorium uh, that they actually isolate then and sell it to, uh, pretty much so at cost because it's a government lab that does it, uh, to make um, radioisotope labeled cancer treatments. Uh, and so if you didn't have the nuclear waste to get it from, we never would have had that. And so kind of synthetic elements do have use more than just from a theoretical point of view. Now can you all guess what my favorite element might be? What kind of chemist am I? I'm an organic chemist, right? So what's my favorite element? Carbon. There you go. I like that. Yeah, carbon. Carbon is my favorite element. It is, uh, in some ways, if you just looked at carbon, it's pretty boring, right? But when you look at its chemistry, it's actually very rich. It sits in a very, well, I call it a privileged position in the periodic table. It's not too electronegative, but it's not too electropositive. It's kind of in the Goldilocks area, just right, you know, and it will, it will form bonds with itself, which most elements will not do. You know, oxygen, you can form two or three atoms being bound together, right? Uh, but if you go higher than that, it becomes explosive. Sulfur, you can get like maybe eight or nine linked together. Other than that, it starts to fall apart. But carbon, oh my gosh, it seems like we can just keep adding carbons to carbons and carbons. And we get these things when we do that called biomolecules. And we get these things called polymers that make all of these materials that we, that we use today. So yeah, carbon is my favorite element. And I definitely want you all to think about, at this point, what your favorite elements may be. Uh, from whatever reason, it doesn't matter. They may just sound cool. Or you might see that they do some chemistry that is just interesting to you. Okay? But think about it. What would be your favorite element? So, yes, we're in the uh, International Year of the Periodic Table. I definitely want you to uh, go out on the web and, and try to identify some, some things that are happening this year as we celebrate that. So, how many years since the periodic table was formulated? 150 years. That sounds like a long time, right? But in the terms of science, it's really not. It's still a fairly modern concept because we've had science now for well over a millennia, right? Uh, and so having the periodic table only for 150 years, um, while it sounds old for us, uh, you know, I've got a grandmother still alive who's getting close to 100. So, you know, the periodic table when she was born was just middle-aged, 50 years old, right? So, um, so that's, that's amazing to think about that we've only had this periodic table for about 150 years. And so even though it's getting quote-unquote old, it's still a very, very important concept that we need to keep, um, keep in mind. So today we're going to jump into uh, a presentation that I used to give. I haven't given this in probably a year. Uh, it's titled, Stop Studying and Start Learning. Uh, can anybody tell me why I might have come up with that particular title? Stop Studying and Start Learning? Why might I have said, Stop Studying? Stop Trying to Memorize Stuff. Stop trying to memorize stuff. Okay, good. Stop Trying to Cram Everything. That's right. What else? Pardon? Okay. That's right. Yep, you all are right. Where I came up with this concept was uh, when I was advising a lot of students, they would come to me and they would say, I just studied so hard, and yet I didn't, I didn't do it. And I'd be like, well, what do you mean by studying? And they would, they would all have a different answer, right? But it all came down to the same kind of things that you all were talking about. Studying is a process that people apply. It's an activity, right? 
uh, yeah, we got to have a process, but it, it's an activity that people kind of do to cram information in to try to get it ready for some main event. That's how students typically think of studying. Okay, there is a difference between studying and learning. Okay, when we learn, right, we may not remember all the facts that we crammed in, but we remember the process in which we can derive answers. We remember how to solve problems. Those are the types of things. The learning is what you are going to take away from your undergraduate career when you forget everything else that you've quote unquote studied for, okay? And so uh, I think it is beneficial if we, if we stop thinking about studying as an activity and start thinking more broadly about our curriculum think more broadly about the program that we're in and think more broadly about what it is that we need to take away from it, okay? You all have chosen this major for a reason, and that reason is individual to each and every one of you. Some of you want to go on into medicine. Some of you want to go on into uh, research, right? Uh, some of you don't know yet. You just know you're kind of interested in the topic, right? But what you learn from this, regardless of the direction that you go, you're going to use the skills that you have learned here, that you have truly mastered, and no matter what you do, whether you, you end up going into the sciences or you end up going in business, whatever the case may be for you at some point, you're going to learn, or you're going to utilize these critical thinking skills that you learn in chemistry, okay? And so what I really mean by stop studying is stop studying as you practice it now, which is what we've been talking about. Many students just, you know, oh, it's two days before the exam. I better start studying, right? How many of you have said that, right? We've all said that. I'm, I'm guilty of it, right? I'm guilty of it right now with my boss, right? Well, I got two weeks before that meeting, I'll, I'll start reviewing the, which is studying, right? I'll start reviewing the material couple days before, right? Uh, we're all guilty of this. But there are certain things that we need to learn as opposed to studying about, right? So what I'm talking about is stop studying the way you're doing it now. Start thinking about those study tips. Start applying your chemistry each and every day in some sort of fashion, okay? So we have already did this just a little bit, but what are some words that come to mind when you think of study and learning? So if study, what kind of words might you associate with studying? Flashcards. Review, very good. Pardon? Quizlet, the app, yeah. I found that the other day, I found that kind of interesting. Is it, is it helpful? Yeah. <laughs> I don't take quizzes anymore, but I, but I ran across it. Yeah? It's like flashcards. It's like you can even have like flashcards or like you can even have like practice tests. Okay. Showing like what you did in that class or something like that. Cool. Never used I mean, I have run across it, but I haven't used it. What, what other kind of words might you associate with, with study? So we've got Quizlet. We've got, what did you say? Note cards, we got review, rereading, okay. What else might come to mind, if anything? How about learning? What kind of words would you associate with learning? Complication? Application, okay, good. Pardon? Mistakes? Wisdom, okay, anything else? Understanding, okay, pardon? Questions, okay. Yeah, so let's see what we, what we came up with, okay. So definitely these are some common ones, and I heard many of things that are either similar, right? Reading, review, research, exercise, homework, cramming, memorize. Those are things that students typically associate with studying. These are things similar to what you all said, right? You can put Quizlet in there and review probably, right? And make it work, right? You're coming up with these types of things, okay? How about learning? 
right? I heard wisdom. Some people say training, research, attainment, permanent, understanding, transferability. When you learn something, if you truly have learned something, you will be able to take it out of the context in which you learned it and apply it in a new contextual setting. Okay? For those of you going on into medicine, you will never open up a patient and get out a test tube to start doing the experiments inside. I mean, it's just not the way this works. But you're going to take those skills that you learned as a chemist, as a chemistry major, and apply those skills, that knowledge in medicine. Biology don't work without chemistry. It's impossible, right? Biology is not a fundamental science. Chemistry, physics, and mathematics are fundamental sciences, right? Actually, mathematics is the fundamental. It can, ex it can exist in theory without chemistry and physics. Chemistry and physics require mathematics, and biology requires chemistry, physics, and mathematics for it to work, right? And so uh, we've got studying, we've got learning. Which one is the boring part? Studying. I don't like to study any more than anybody else does. Right? It's work. You got to sit down and you got to read stuff. But you know what? I can sit down and I can read stuff and I can learn nothing. I have done the exact activity of studying and I can have studied hard. I can be hungry at the end of it. But if I come away going, what did I just read? What did I, I all I've done is wasted my time. Right? And I, have a habit of getting to that stage. And I have to call, uh, call myself back from that sometimes. So when I'm reading books at home, I have a bad habit, and it is a bad habit, of trying to read before I go to bed. Well, I start to read, get into it, and then all of a sudden I start dozing off, I read a little bit. And then the next morning I wake up and I go, I don't remember what I read. I gotta start all over again. So it was a great way to get me to sleep, right? But it was a poor way to actually learn. Why would you say that learning is less boring than studying? Something new. Something new. Okay. What else? I can apply it. That's right. I can apply it, right? I can see an application for the information that I've just learned or the process that I've learned or whatever the, the case may be, right? What else? Absolutely. You start to, t in my opinion, you really start to tap into your passions a little bit when you're starting to learn things versus studying. When I was in college, um, you know, we had these things called general education courses just like you all have. I had to take an awful lot more than you all have to, had to take now, uh, which isn't a bad thing. But there were certain courses that I felt like I learned in and there were certain courses that today I couldn't tell you and it, it came down to that passion piece. You know, I saw an application to it. I saw how it fit in. Um, and so, for example, I really enjoyed my philosophy class. I learned an awful lot in my philosophy class. I learned how to think in my philosophy class, which helped me in so many areas of my life. I thoroughly enjoyed my, and learned a lot in my uh, film lecture course. It's where I started to have an appreciation for Classic movies, as opposed to just what was a blockbuster at the movie theater at the time. Okay? I did not particularly care for my Spanish classes. And so I studied an awful lot for them, but I never really built a passion for learning Spanish. Yes, I, I learned some words. I learned how to speak it a little bit. I learned enough to get a good B in the class. But today, I would, I would, you know, I could probably brush up and speak Spanish, you know, if I bought something like Rosetta Stone or Babel or something and spent some time learning. Uh, but it wasn't part of my passion. I had some other passionate areas. And so th I definitely studied for some classes, and I definitely did some learning in other classes. And we want you to maximize the amount of learning that you're doing in all of your classes, right? We think we have a good curriculum set up for you uh, as you all were putting together your semester by semester guides, you should, should, should be getting more of an idea of how everything is connected. Right? That's, that was kind of the goal of that, of that process. Okay. The, go the goal is to keep yourself in learning mode and keep yourself out of study mode as much as possible. Now, to learn, you do have to do some studying. There's no doubt about that. But I don't want you just to focus on the study part. I want you to change your mindset to that growth mindset and to think about 
how you can learn the material more so than you can just study. Okay? So let me give you an example. Let's suppose that I ask you to teach a class on a specific topic next week. You'll need to prepare materials for the class. You'll need to prepare a presentation. You may even need to prepare a series of activities for the other students uh, to satisfy my expectations of you teaching this ne class next week. Okay? So tell me, are you going to study that specific topic or are you going to try to learn the topic? You're going to try to learn it, aren't you? Because you don't want to come into class and be embarrassed, do you? How might you use this example to reframe how you are learning your material now? Ah, very good. So you had a you had a comment. Yep, no, that's exactly right. You're both both right on the money with this, right? Uh, if you all are studying by yourself, and there's going to be some of that that has to happen, you're only getting part of your learning experience. I went all the way through my undergraduate, and I went all the way through my graduate studies, and I went all the way through my postdoctoral work without really learning my subject like I should have until I had to come here and teach it. Actually, when I taught it at Vanderbilt. I taught at Vanderbilt for a year. So when I walked into that first Gen Chem class that I had to teach is when I really, really, really started learning the material at its most fundamental level. Believe it or not, I'd already had a PhD. I'd had a couple of years of postdoctoral experience. I had papers. I had publications. I had presentations. I knew my material for what I was working on extraordinarily well, but I never had to teach it to anybody. So why I knew what I knew, my confidence in what I knew were, was not where it needed to be. So it is very, very important, in my opinion, that you all work with each other, build study groups, where you're not just studying together, but you are learning together. You are teaching each other. Okay? That's the important part. I can sit here and talk all day. Dr. Broom can sit there and talk all day to you about chemistry, but you're not going to learn it there. There are two places you're going to learn it. You're going to learn it by teaching it to somebody else, and I don't care if that somebody else is a plant sitting in the corner. The act of actually trying to teach somebody else will make you learn this material more than anything else you can do. And two, you're going to learn it in the laboratory. Right? You're going to learn things, or be taught, I should say, things in class about balancing chemical equations, doing other things like that. While that's important, you will not understand that until you actually have to do it or teach somebody else that material. And so that's why lab is so important. You're getting skills out of lab in terms of manipulating pieces of equipment and other things, very, very important. But I would argue the more important part of that is that's the place where you have to apply the information to a real setting. You've got a real problem to solve, right? So will you spend more time preparing for the class you need to teach, or will you spend more time preparing for your next exam? If this was a class where you had exams, and we're not, right, would you spend more time and be honest with yourself, would you spend more time preparing for the exam in the class, or would you spend more time preparing to teach the class to, to, the, to the fellow students in here? What do you think? What would you spend more time doing? Mm -hmm. That's right. Everybody would. Because you would have to be here where I am right now and be confident in the material that you have to do. On an exam, you're over there by yourself, right? And nobody has to know anything because I can't tell anybody by FERPA rules that, well, you know, what you made on a grade. 
right? I'm bound by federal law that I can't come out and say, oh, you got an A, great, you got a B, you, got, you know, whatever the case may be. But if I had you come up and actually teach and demonstrate what you know, you're going to spend an awful lot of time doing that and mastering that material before you have to come and teach it. And so I think if you will treat everything that you do in that way, think about it, okay, I've got to study. Well, now how can I study in a way to, that makes me prepared to teach it to somebody? Okay, I think you will have a different attitude towards, towards a lot of this. So, this Latin phrase, descendo discimus, by teaching we learn. I think that's very, very true. I think if you go around and talk to almost all of your professors, they will tell you, if they are honest with you, that they really didn't understand the material until they had to go into a classroom and teach it. That's certainly the case for me. And again, although this is a fairly small class, I've taught classes of two, 250 students. When you feel like you, have, you are ready to go in and talk about the material of the day to 250 students, you don't know what kind of questions you're going to get. You make sure that you are ready for that. Okay? And so by teaching, we do learn. So think about that. I'm not asking you to go teach a class, but I'm asking you to incorporate teaching the material that you're trying to learn to somebody else as part of your study regimen. It will help you, I promise. Okay? So how do we learn? Okay, this is called metacognition, thinking about, how, thinking about thinking, thinking about how we learn, right? I would wager very few of you have ever done this. You've thought of learning as going in and putting stuff in your brain and then trying to, to regurgitate it. You know what? We don't need people like that anymore in the world. We've got Google. We've got access by our phone to more information than we've ever had in the history of mankind. I don't need people who just know a lot of facts. You got to know some facts to apply things. Yes, that's true. But we need more people in the workforce, more people in medicine who can acquire the information they need, know what it is that they need, and then process it. Okay? That's what we need. Okay? And so here's an example. I really like this little cartoon. So I taught Stripe to whistle. I don't hear him whistling. I said I taught him. I didn't say he learned it. When I leave the class today, I have taught you what I intended to teach. Whether you learned it or not is up to you. Okay? I can help facilitate that learning. Your professors can help facilitate that learning, but they cannot learn you. They can teach you, but they cannot learn you. It's kind of the same thing between studying and learning, teaching and learning. Okay? Yes, they are different. Okay? There's this learning cycle. And I'm certainly not an, an, an expert in it, but you can read the whole paper. Uh, it's available free on, on, online if you go to the website. Uh, but this is, this is kind of our learning cycle. There is concrete experience. Where might you be getting concrete experience in your curriculum right now? Laboratory. It's one of the reasons why I fight for lab experiences for students. That's why I want you all to get involved in more than just your required laboratory courses. I want you to be involved in research earlier, and we'll talk about that later. This is where you're really going to learn the material. This is where the rubber hits the road, right? This is where you can actually put your tactile feelings into play with, with how you, the, the information. Reflective observation, right? Where might you get reflective observation? Again, in the lab, right? You might be getting this in a lab. You watch your TA do a demonstration of how to set something up before you go do it, right? Abstract conceptualism, thinking about it. Active experimentation, doing. When you look at all of these things, I always think about laboratory. <laughs> in this learning cycle, this is why this um, learning takes place. This has also been impacting how we teach. When I was in college, you went to class three times a week. Lab was Tuesdays and Thursdays. And when you walked into a lecture hall, it was a lecture hall of 250, 300 students. You took some notes and you left. You never interacted with the, with the faculty member, right? I never 
had a faculty member in a large lecture class ever ask me a single question. They went up there and they lectured. They gave us their information, their wisdom, and then they walked out of the classroom. They never forced me to think about the information. Okay? We now do things differently. You all, for those of you in general chemistry, go to an active learning classroom where things are different. Learning is a struggle. It's supposed to be. <laughs> if, if you're really learning something, you will be struggling because you don't know it. You're grappling with it. And it's how you grapple with it as to how you put it together in your brain, and that's how you remember it. That's how you have learned it. If you don't struggle with it, you ain't learning it. Okay? And yes, I say ain't every now and then. All right? But these experiences are very, very important to your learning process. Making mistakes. You should not look at making mistakes as failure. I want you to make mistakes in class. Believe me. If you end up being my physician when I have my first heart attack, I want you to make mistakes in class, <laughs> not on me, right? Failures, these aren't a bad thing. Nobody wants to fail. I get it. You definitely don't want to fail on exam, so if you're going to fail, where should you fail? When you're practicing, when you're doing your homework, when you're trying to teach somebody else, right? I want pilots to fail at flying in the simulator. I don't want them to fail at flying on my way to California, right? Repeat performance, interactions with others, personal reflection. That's why I'm having you all keep a notebook. Personal reflection is very important. What does this mean to me? That video is going to mean something different for you than it will for you. But it still has meaning to both of you, right? But you have to reflect on that. Okay? You have to reflect on it. The learning pyramid, as I like to call it, or Bloom's taxonomy, right? Where do you think you stand on the pyramid right now? Remembering? Okay, you're all a freshman, come in with a high school education. I would say you're probably somewhere at remembering and understanding. I think some of you aren't giving yourself enough credit. You are probably at a beginning point in this where you are not just only remembering things, but starting to understand some of the things that you, you're learning in your chemistry and other classes. Okay, so you're probably here, but it's foundational, and that's okay. That's where you're supposed to be. Where do we want you to be? We want you to be more towards the top when you leave the institution. We want you to be able to at least evaluate information, especially scientific information. The number of people that just are science deniers because they don't know how to evaluate the information that's in front of them, it doesn't feel right to them, astounds me. You all as citizens need to be able to evaluate a set of facts and figures and determine whether or not that makes sense. Every, every citizen in society needs to do that. Okay? Creating is a very important part. It's one of the reasons why we have you take things like art classes. Because it helps in the creative process. Even though you're a scientist, I want you to leave the institution at some point creating something in your job, in your medical career. I want you to create value to society, right? All of those things are important here. Hopefully, by the end of the semester, you'll find that you're starting to apply more stuff. You're able to apply that information uh, in, in different contexts and then ultimately get to analyzing, evaluating, and creating. Okay? Metacognition. Okay? This, these 10 metacognitive strategies come from uh, this book called Teach Students How to Learn. By, Don, uh, by Dr. Uh, Sondra Yancey McGuire. Uh, and it's a, it's a very good book. Um, it is definitely one of the books that I did not read trying to go to sleep. Uh, I wanted to learn this information. Um, and I think there's some, some wisdom in this. One of the things that you always need to do in all of your classes if you want to learn your information is you need to preview it before you get there. 
Your faculty in every class should have given you a syllabus that has a reading outline in it. Do I expect you to have learned all the material when you come to a class? Absolutely not, but I expect you to have at least previewed it. I expect you to at least know what the main words are, the main concepts are. If it's, it's, called, it's like painting a car, guys. You don't just paint a car after you've stripped it down. You have to prime it. Previewing is priming your brain to be ready to take on that coating of paint of information. And if you don't do it, it won't stick. You can be extremely intelligent. This, all this has nothing to do with your intelligence level. But if you don't prepare and preview, things aren't going to stick. You got to be prepared for active reading. So many people, myself included, I have to find my, I have to tell myself to actively read. Will passively, a lot of people will just passively read. You, you, you read the words. How might you know when you've started getting into an, a passive reading mode? You don't remember what I just read. And when you get to that point, you might as well close the book and walk away for a while. Because all you're going to do is waste your time. You might as well do your laundry, go eat something, something a little more productive. Okay? Active reading is so important. You need to be able to paraphrase. You need to be able to take a concept and in just a few words, paraphrase what it means. Very important. Active reading. Right? Actively reading the material, understanding it when you read it. Asking yourself questions about it as you're reading it, that is active reading. Okay? This is, this is, this is a killer for me. Using the textbook. Using it correctly. When I was teaching organic chemistry, we'd be halfway through the semester. I'd have a student come to me, Dr. Messner, I don't understand this concept. I'd say, well, pull out your textbook. And they'd say, I don't have a textbook. What do you mean you don't have a textbook? I assumed that you read the material before you came to class. That, that was our deal. Oh, no, I don't, have a, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a textbook. Well, no wonder you don't understand anything. You, don't, you haven't come prepared. You haven't come primed, ready to accept the knowledge. I thought you knew the vocabulary before I started talking, right? Or they'll come and they had a textbook and they open it and I hear it crack because it's never been opened. Now, how many people in here think textbooks are too expensive? It doesn't matter whether it costs $10 or $200. If you don't use it, it's too expensive. Okay? I can get you cheaper textbooks. I can put things on reserve over in the library for you. If you don't use it, it's inexpensive. A $200 organic textbook over two semesters, if you use it and get everything out of it, that's money well spent, my friend. Money well spent. Number one resource right there. Attend class and take notes by hand. There is something about taking notes by hand that is different than this. I don't know what it is, but it's true. Okay? How much do y'all spend per minute to be in class? Anybody know? If you took tuition and all that, you're spending about 50 cents a minute to be in a classroom. That's what your tuition comes to. I've had students in the past that go, well, I had to skip class because I got a job. And I went, your job pays $25 an hour? No, 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 I make, I make, tw I make $10 an hour. I'm like, well, you just paid me $25 to skip my class because that's what it costs for a 50-minute class. So you went to a $10 an hour job to pay $25 for that hour that you missed. You got to think about it in these terms. That's real, right? 50 cents a minute to be in class. You need to get 75 cents worth out of it, okay? 10 class, it's the number one thing. The difference between people that get A's and that get below A's is class attendance 90% of the time. Do your homework without using examples when assigned. View your homework as your opportunity to make mistakes and to practice, okay? Teach the material. Find somebody to teach it to. Work in groups, but work in a smart group. What do I mean by that? I don't mean with just a bunch of smart people. People have a habit of congregating with other individuals that are in the same boat that they are. I don't understand this material. Well, neither do I. Well, hey, let's get together and let's study. <laughs> well, I, what, well, what are we going to study? I don't know. I don't understand it. Well, me neither. Well, that doesn't make any sense. 
you need to find groups of people that, that are struggling with things that you understand and they understand things that, that you're struggling with and you need to teach each other. But far too often what happens in study groups is three or four people get together that are all don't understand anything about the material that, that they want to review and they sit and end up chatting about you know, the upcoming thing at the sorority or fraternity or whatever activity is going on and end up wasting their time. You need to actively look for individuals who can complement you in your study and who you can complement them. Very, very important. And that's a harder conversation to have. But finding people that have skills that will help you out and you have skills that will help them out are a great way to, to move with it. Very important, create your own exam. As you are actively reading, you need to be ask, saying to yourself, this would be a good exam question. And make it up. Make up your own exam. Okay? Make your own questions. Study those questions. Know how to answer them forwards and backwards, and you will do really well. And then I'm going to add 11, which is personal reflection of your performance. When you get your, those assignments back, when you get that feedback, don't just look at the number on the, on the paper and go, okay, I got an A. Go in and look at the feedback that the professor has given you on your writing assignments and other types of work, okay? Very, very important. If you don't reflect personally, you will not grow. And we want you all to grow, right? So apparently I've got a little animation with that one. All right, good. So here's the study cycle. You're going to preview. You're going to attend class. You're going to review. You're going to study. You're going to assess, right? You're going to preview the material before class. That's priming your brain, right? You're going to attend class each period. USM, you're paying about 50 cents a minute. Actually, you're paying more than that now. Tuition went up a couple years ago, right? You're paying more than 50 cents a minute to be here. That's a lot of money, right? You need to review after class while it's still fresh. Review your notes. Rewrite your notes. Whatever works for you. Don't wait until the day before the next class. Do it as quickly. Now, I know some of you have classes that are back to back. You can't do it immediately. But within the day, you need to review your material. She says study. I say learning mode, right? And then assess. The only way to assess what you know is to work problems. That is the only way in, in the sciences to know whether or not you thoroughly understand the materials, to look at those homework problems, find additional problems, get Quizlet, whatever, the, whatever you need, but assess your ability to know that material. Okay? So we're going to call this not the study cycle, we're going to call this the learning cycle. Okay? And notice this is a feedback loop. It's not just one round. Okay? Very important. There's also a thing called the Feynman technique that you all can uh, learn about. Anybody know who Richard Feynman was? He died before you all were born. But he was a very famous physicist. Worked on the Manhattan Project during World War II. Won a Nobel Prize. And if you, ever, if you ever get a chance, do some YouTube video searching on him and, and listen to him give some of his... He was known as a master teacher in addition to being a uh, master scientist. He knew how to teach people very difficult, complex problems. And he did it because he said, if he couldn't think about it simply, then it wasn't worth thinking about. He knew how to break complicated, or what were apparently complicated phenomena down into very simple, easy to understand things. He could teach anybody off the street about quantum physics. That's amazing. He had that ability. But he came up with what's called the Feynman technique. And in a nutshell, you don't understand a topic if you can't explain it in simple terms to your grandmother, grandfather, or a young child, is basically what he said. If I can't sit there and tell somebody and have them understand at a fundamental level what it is I'm talking about, I really don't understand it. So step one in the Feynman technique is to get a notebook and write the title of the concept you wish to learn at the top of the page. 
and then write down everything you know about that concept on that page. Step two is explain that concept in simple, term, simple terms. Can you explain it to someone on the street? Work some examples. And then step three is review your explanation and identify areas that you struggled to explain in simple terms. That's self-reflection, right? Go back to the books, notes, add new things you learned on the notebook page. If it takes more than a page for a concept, you don't understand much about it. You should be able to distill it down to a simple page, okay? And then step four is identify areas where you used a lot of technical language. Think about these areas and try to simplify. Use analogies. I use analogies all the time. The periodic table allows us to use analogies, right? Oh, we know the chemistry of sulfur does this. Selenium's right under that. Maybe it'll be similar. It's analogous. It's an analogy, right? Is it going to be identical? No. But it allows us to use those analogies to help predict things, okay? So you can definitely go to this College Info Geek, find information on the Feynman technique. It works, okay? And uh, Dr. Feynman was the lead scientist.